I understand we're having some audio difficulties, so please use the microphone today when you're ready to speak up. It would be much appreciated. All right. Can we call the roll, please? Yeah. 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 Here. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have a presentation from IDL, but we're going to hold off on that a little bit and go ahead and do the reports from uh, finance and administration first. Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. So we're going to do that. Um, reviewing your financials, uh, they all look good. I um, don't know if anybody has specific questions, so if you do, let me know. I'm going to hit the high points. Um, power and light, um, we are a little bit ahead of where we anticipated for the year on revenue and pretty much right on in the expense side. Um, nothing, again, is really out of whack and uh, a very big number. Some, again, some numbers look high percentages of dollars or items. So, um, so then I'll just move on to water. Water is pretty much right on for revenue here today, and the expenses are a little bit under where we anticipated for the year. Uh, again, nothing extreme is standing out. Um, we are in the, think about this because I'm, of course, a month ahead of these financials because these are as of October. Um, so this is a fourth month of the fiscal year that we're reporting on here. Um, sewer, uh, WPC is pretty much, again, right on for revenue where, where we anticipated, and expenses are a little bit lower than we had anticipated. But again, nothing that really stands out to me um, as concerning or anything special to point out. So, Again, if you guys have questions in particular, let me know, or if any of the directors have anything they have on their radar to point out. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Hearing one. Thank you. Uh, municipal services. We don't have anything to officially report from us, but if you guys have any questions for me. Um, on any sanitary operations in the city. How comes the line step relationship? It's still on? moving along, yes. It's actually still tracking with our anticipated completion date. So those delays from our last reported anticipated completion, so hopefully we can continue so. Yeah. Um I watched the city council meeting the other night, saw the presentation on the trash. And so my question, I think, to Star is they, they were there was some talk back and forth about adding it as a line item and utility state. So how would they how are they doing this with it's going to be considered a service, correct? So it's an option that we're considering, um, and that would be only if the city goes down the path of facilitating the contract. It wouldn't technically become a utility because we're not getting into the cash business ourselves. Um, it would just be a billing mechanism to ensure everyone actually had um, service. And but we'd be collecting the money. Correct? We would in, in that scenario. But there are lots of options. And um, at this moment, there's still nothing requiring uh, residential cash service. So. Okay. And then my other question is does that mean that you all will be? Kind of bringing that to us if that's going to be a if that's going to be a service then that put PUAB dealing with that by the charter no it would not be a utility so it wouldn't be anything that would count as for but PUAB. it's a service it, this it is be a, a service wouldn't it it's a contract if depending on the method of if it, if it's approved it would be a contract just like we administer hundreds of contracts. So that would not be a service, it would be administering a contract. Even if we had a coordinator overseeing the process and that contract of resolving that. Right. We have coordinators that oversee lots of contracts. Um, 
Okay. Yes. Anybody else have anything? All right. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Kind of like Lisa didn't have any particular, but I thought I would just bring us up to the speed, draw up to speed on Mitchell Avenue water main replacement. That's a one point one million dollar four thousand two hundred feet of pipe. I believe we just put that online just in the last week. Uh, so they're doing uh, the they'll be hooking up the residences over to the new mains, which they've done. And now they'll be dealing with like you can even cut and saw on Monday. So, you know, barring the weather, hopefully they can get that done in the next month or so. So the restoration is complete, or they're, they're working on that and done over the month. That's the same company that will be doing Salisbury Road, which is a million dollar project. They'll be going out, and that's a uh, 2,864 feet of pipe that they'll move her over onto that once they leave the project. So they've got some pipe lined up. They've done a good job. And I drove through on the way to the leadership meeting this morning, Truman Road by the power plant. So you guys can appreciate it down the other end. We're, we're completing uh, the Truman Road project. That's about a half a million dollar project, 1,300 feet. Old house construction has done that work. Got the pipeline completed. I think they had some tie ins to make and uh, some work to do there. But uh, the reason why that one's kind of a big project is years and years ago, I've been here quite a while. We've completed that pipe, some 1950 inch pipe from 291 all the way to Truman Road. So that, that is completely, all that pipe has now been replaced. And it's a big deal because we had a lot of main breaks that are like a lot of through the years where they might have been out of water because uh, they got a, a manufacturer across the street. Sometimes they uh, slam something shut a little too quick and pull the main out of the ground. But all that work's been done, so uh, uh, we're fortunate there. And that particular whole house is also going to, as another project that we've awarded to them, but the hang up there, they're going to be doing the Northern Boulevard and Ralston project, which is a $825,000 project. Uh, another 2,000, well, I guess 3,000 feet of pipe there. But the problem is, is that they can't get pipe. So the, the contractors order the material and they'll get that the third quarter of 2023. So I think gems have the same issue we have. We're having a hard time buying hydrants, you know, whether it's transformers, hydrants, paint to paint the fire hydrants, whatever the case may be, there's some issues right now with just getting stuff in a timely manner. So uh, bear with us. But uh, the good news is they've made a lot of progress and I just thought I'd be sure to stay on this topic. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Callahan, Dan, those guys are working really hard on the water tower. It's got to be cold up there, as windy as it is. Uh, for everybody else, I live over by uh, 39th and Davidson. We have a big water tower over there. They started the project about a month, month and a half ago. And to do the job, you have to sandblast it prime it, and then paint it, and it is a job. Those, they don't look big because they set so low to the ground. How many gallons? So that's five million gallons of storage, and it's there in the United States, and that right right under. Yeah, it's it's gigantic, and it's all relative to five million. What's so bad is when they sandblast an area, and it gets rain before they have a chance to put the prime on, they have to sandblast it again. Right. So, it's, uh, it's quite a job. And yeah, that was definitely needed. Aesthetically, it looked a little yeah. rough. So. I was going to uh, give you drone footage of what had happened, but my drone hit a tree. <laughs> Trees and drones don't mix. Um, hopefully, I'll get a replacement drone soon enough that I can send it around and say, oh, look how nice. I appreciate that. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I believe that you know, the problem is you're here. All right. Thank you. Uh, IPL. I yes, sir. didn't have anything to report, but I did have something that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, a call came into the mayor's office this week. Uh, some residents had been visited by a salesman uh, talking about. 
putting solar on their on their house. And uh, as far as we know, the company itself is a reputable company, but the salesman was claiming to be uh, associated with IDL, uh, stated that the company had a contract with IDL, but they had office space here at the IUC, and on and on and on. Um, told them that some of their neighbors had signed up. They called their neighbors and they said, no, we didn't, but he told us you did. So we've got some folks out there that are less than scrupulous uh, about their sales tactics. And I would encourage any of our residents, if they are approached, do their homework, contact IPL. We will we'll walk them through the process as far as uh, you know, what they can expect. Uh, but just be aware, that there, there are salesmen out there that are less than honest. Um, we do not have a contract with any solar installers. We have no agreement with any solar companies or installers. We certainly don't provide them office space here at the IUC. So if, if they've got funny looking badges, probably not on the oven. Thank you for that information. That was really important. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Mr. Bowman, Thank you. All right. As everyone's aware, there have been a lot of questions over the past year or two years about IPL finances, um, our, our fund balance, where we're headed, uh, how expensive some of our projects are, and uh, We've been working over the last several months to come up with a, a presentation to walk you through this process and explain to you, give you an idea of where we're at and um, where we can be in the future. First of all, to look at where we are currently. Uh, during the bonding process last year, um, and earlier this year, we were evaluated as still having an A minus credit rating. That is a favorable rating. An A rating means you are investment worthy, strong um, financial uh, picture. And uh, in spite of all the things you hear, the finance institutions rated us as still with a favorable A minus rating. Now, that does not mean that we aren't in a, a challenging fiscal position. Because as everyone can see from our uh, recent history, expenses have exceeded revenues um, when you include everything all together. And that's obviously not a long-term picture that we can, we can look at. But the, that favorable rating says that compared to other utilities, compared to other businesses, we are still uh, a strong, credit-worthy, investment-worthy institution. And in fact, we were able to sell those bonds uh, without any problem. Um, one of the things that goes into that assessment is that unlike an investor-owned utility, we have, the city has the ability to set our own rates and fees. Um, so from a financial standpoint, instead of having to go to the Public Service Commission or some other bodies to get permission, the city has the power to set those rates and help help to stabilize our financial picture. Now, in order to in order to do this analysis, we worked with a consultant to develop a very detailed analysis tool. It's about 18 linked spreadsheets that cover a wide, wide variety of all the different parameters that go into what our, our financial picture looks like. The model included all the different things that go into our, our financial reports, our, the various expenses, fuel, energy, contracts, debt service, personnel, benefits, all those things get included in this analysis. And then all the various uh, sources of revenue that are included, our debt service, um, any investments, all of that is, is included in this, um, this model. First of all, you have to take into account that we are a municipal utility, so we are self-funded, entirely self-funded. Um, we don't rely on, on 
other sources of income outside of our own business. Um, so that's funded through energy sales, fees for services, uh, recovery of transmission costs. There's a few other items in there, but that's that's the main source of what our revenue consists of. Those rates and fees are set by ordinance, so it is a, a decision of the city council, uh, reviewed by the public utility advisory board in advance, and that revenue has to support everything: our operations and maintenance, capital projects, the pilot payment uh, in lieu of taxes, uh, debt service. All of those have to be supported by that one source of revenue. Um, some of the things that went into this model um, are purchase power costs, and those are forecast based on the contracts that we have. We know that our contracts include certain escalations throughout the life of the contract. There's other factors in those that, that we can predict fairly, fairly accurately, so that's included. Um, this model has not included any any assumption on new generation or new contracts. We're taking a look at a snapshot of where we are right now. Uh, we do, we have the ability to program into it assumed increases for inflation. We've assumed 3%. I did check the Bureau of Labor Statistics say that over the last 10 years, it's averaged 2.67%. So 3% is a, a, a good, good estimate. Um, we include an estimate of our capital projects. Um, I think as everybody knows, we've not been keeping up with uh, depreciation in our in our capital. We've used capital as a way to balance the budget or, or try to balance the budget and defer projects. And as, I think as everybody knows, that is not a sustainable long-term move. At some point you have to you have to maintain your infrastructure. We've been averaging about $4 million a year in new requests. You'll see from year to year, you'll see capital balances of 14 million, 15 million, but that's, that's things that have rolled over from one year to the next. It's about 4 million a year in new requests. This model to try to catch us up to where we should be, we're, we've put in 8 million. Um, there's a number of different benchmarks that are used. Some institutions will estimate that you should at least keep up with depreciation so that you're replacing it as fast as you're aging it out. Another, est another rough estimate is 10% of revenue, um, but eight million would be double what we're doing now, so we think that's a, a good place to start. With that in mind, this is our current picture. This is where we are right now with our current rates, current fees, those estimates that I put in there, the 3% for inflation. Um, you can see that we fall below our, our minimum threshold of $25 million in 2025. If we do nothing but just go along the way we are right now, we're below 25 million in 2025. This, this graph also shows just how far it goes, and we dropped down to almost 100 million in the red by 2032. We're below zero after 2027. So again, this is, this is the trajectory that we're on right now. Now, this is not a surprise. We've been getting these projections since at least 2015. A rate study was done in 2015. That consultant recommended holding steady for a couple of years, let the, let the reserves come down just a bit, and then it, it projected some like 3.3% increases in 18, 19, and 20 to maintain things level. That wasn't implemented. In 2018, we commenced another study to review it. In the middle of that consultant's work, the council adopted the 2% reduction. So the consultant went back to the drawing board to incorporate that into his model. And he was projecting that we could live off our reserves for a few years, but by, 20, by 2025, it would require a 14% increase to correct the ship. Again, these recommendations weren't implemented. And in fact, that 2% reduction was increased to a 6% reduction um, a couple of years ago. 
So where we are now is we've got this negative trajectory. It's projected to get us below our minimum threshold in just three years from now, in 2025. So we need to look ahead to see what do we need to do? What corrections do we need to make? Um, part of that planning is to look at where we expect, where do we expect our expenses to go? And the answer is up. Labor and benefit costs are continuing to increase about 3% a year. Fuel and energy costs remain high. Right now, those are primarily driven by natural gas prices. Um, just a few years ago, natural gas was estimated that it was going to stay right around $4. Now it's 6 and 7 so it almost doubled the, the original projection. Those gas prices are in turn driving the energy market prices higher. Um, equipment and materials, part of it because of the energy cost, but the materials cost, we've also seen steady increases in those. So we have to, we have to assume that those, in, those cost increases are going to continue to go up. And when you look back over a 10-year period, the average does tend to stay fairly steady in, in, in the uh, increase. Capital investment. We have to continue maintaining the plant. We know we've got poles that will need to be replaced. We'll have conductors that need to be replaced. There'll be upgrades required at some of the substations and some of the other facilities around town. So we need to build that into the plan for the future as well. We also have to look at what can we expect out on the horizon? One of those is we know that we have expiring contracts for capacity and for some of our purchase power agreements. Those will, have a, they, those will come to an end, and at some point we'll have to examine what do we need to do to replace those, get something different, can we extend them, but we'll have to, be, we'll have to do some planning for that. And we'll need to make sure that since some of those are rather expensive, while it's always advisable to cash fund your capital as much as you can, if there's some big ticket projects, those may require some type of funding, some type of financing. So we need to make sure that our, our cash flow will also cover that debt service. Another impact on our costs is the continual movement to renewable resources. As the country continues to shift emphasis to more and more wind, solar, hydro, batteries, um, that puts pressure on the rest of the system. Many coal plants, have that's gone into disfavor and, and they're retiring them. As they pull those coal plants out of service, that puts more pressure on the gas units and nuclear and others to make up that gap. Um, and with gas being the demand for gas being what it is, that in turn raises prices. One of the other issues is capacity. When we got the Oneta contract, there was an abundance of capacity on the market, and we got a pretty good deal for what we got. Now what we're seeing is as those coal plants retire, there's less capacity, surplus capacity, and as analysis of various systems get more and more closer to the margins, people that have excess capacity are pulling it off of the market in case they need it themselves. So the capacity that remains gets more expensive. Uh, last, the third quarter uh, this year, in some markets, capacity costs went up as much as 30% in one quarter. Uh, so we can continue to expect those kind of things to in continue to increase going into the future. This is a picture that shows where we're at right now with, with our energy resources. If you start at the bottom, that's Nebraska City, Iatan, uh, Dogwood, and then you start seeing the smaller bands are solar, uh, the Marshall Wind and Smoky Hills projects, our three substations, and then Oneta at the top. The solid line is our peak demand. <clears throat> the dashed line is the obligation we have with Southwest Power Pool. You can see that starts sloping upward a little bit. Southwest Power Pool, starting next year, increased our, our requirement from 112% to 115%. So that pushed us a little closer to the margins. 
you can see in this graph, we're okay. We've got margin. We've had very stable load for the last number of years. We haven't seen a lot of load growth. We have projected in this model about 1% a year, thinking that if North Point really takes off, we could start seeing some incremental increase in load there. Uh, projects like Cargo Largo can certainly add additional load to the system. So we see that we see our load requirement increasing a little bit, and then the obligation for the 15% surplus on top of that. The first thing that you actually see go away in 2028 is the Smoky Hills contract expires. Um, and after that, the next one that drops off is Onetta. And that's when we, in 2028, uh, 2029, after that is when we end up with a deficit. So somewhere between now and 2029, we have to come up with a solution that's going to give us the additional capacity. Now, one thing you'll note, this picture assumes that all six of those combustion turbines continue to be part of our fleet. There's no, there's no room in here for any retirements um, based on the scenario that you're looking at right there in front of you. So we've got, we've got a short window of time that we have to evaluate how are we going to meet that capacity demand? How are we going to, going to enable potential retirements of some of the older units and to, to move our, our uh, fleet ahead? Again, this is something that Power & Light has been studying for years. Uh, if you go back and look at our master plans uh, every five, about every five years, they've, they've been projecting this and they've been looking at you know, scenarios of, of what things are possible, what kind of things we can do. And Power & Light staff, this shows some of what's possible. The red is if we were the, the new generation that was proposed earlier this year, uh, that would give us a good boost and get us up above the line going through several years there. That would also then enable us room or time to make other decisions on our timeline, not Southwest Power Pools or not GEs or anybody else's, but we would be, we would have more flexibility to make some of those decisions. So what some of the things you see in there, you have the, the new generation proposal, um, the orange bar that pops up in 2029, that would be possibly a battery installation. We know sub J, we can't get gas service there to run combustion turbines. So if we, if we retired those two units, we could potentially put a battery uh, resource there. By 2029, I would hope that Southwest Power Pool has the bugs worked out where we could actually use that as a dispatchable resource. And if, if they know they're gonna be short for 30 minutes, you don't wanna fire up a fossil fuel unit of any kind for 20, 30 minutes, but you certainly could dispatch batteries for 30 minutes and make up that gap. That's a potential revenue source for us that that, that would fit into. Um, the other things you see in there, um, Possibly new, new generation at sub I, if we retire those. Um, some other possibilities that we've looked at are additional wind contracts, other solar, solar projects, but all of these take time to develop. They all take time to get permitted and get, work them through Southwest Power Pools uh, process and then actually get them constructed. So no matter what we do, we have to have some time in there to work with. Um, and we've got to convince you and everyone else that we have a solid footing to help us get there. So the first thing that we recommend is that we remove the 6% discount. During the time of COVID, our residents had, were having a tough time, absolutely. And the city decided that we were in a position that we could help them and so with a 6% discount was put on the, on the utility bills. Um, however, go back to that previous graph, you can see that we're heading down rapidly to a point that we would be, be below our minimum threshold. If we just remove the 6% discount and go, and go back to our 2012 rates, again, 
that's an important distinction. Our last increase was in 2012. So if we remove the discount, we're just going back to the rates we charged for the last 10 years. You can see that in that case, in that scenario, it lifts that curve a little bit. We don't hit the we don't hit the 25 million minimum threshold until 20 after 2028, um, and we get down into completely uh, lost all of our reserves around 2030. So this does removing that six percent discount will add um, two to three years to the window that we have to work with here and keep us above that threshold. Can I ask a real yes. quick question? Do you have any idea what removing that 6% like on the average bill, how much is that? Sure. The average, the av right now, the average residential bill in Independence is about $100, $111, $120 in that frame. <coughs> so 6% would be about $7. So if your if your bill for for every hundred dollars that your utility bill, it'd be a six dollar increase. Thank you. Now we're not the only ones facing this. We've reached out to MPUA and we've also checked the news. And utilities all around the Midwest here are looking at rate increases, and they're anywhere from five percent to fourteen percent. Um, they've got different ways they they want or proposed to, to implement that, but. The utilities around us who have also had rate increases since 2012 are looking at five to 14 percent. And this first step is for us to just restore our 2012 rates. What another concern that I keep hearing is, but we already charge more than everybody else. No, we don't. You can't look at just the cents per kilowatt hour and say that that's the bill, because that's not the entire basis of the bill. I happen to live in Evergy's territory. They've got like four or five different rates that they charge for different things, plus the customer charge, plus the the finance or the, uh, the uh, franchise fee. When you add up the average person's bill, if you were to take that $111 monthly bill and run it through Evergy's billing system, it would come out higher. If you would run it through, and Evergy's got two different groups, there's Evergy Metro and Evergy West. In both cases, that bill would come out either the same or higher. BPU, their rates would come out the same or higher. There's a couple of business cases where it comes out a little bit less, but for the most part, the check you write is, a, is pretty much the same across the metro area. Uh, so our rates, well, the kilowatt, the cents per kilowatt hour may be higher. The overall bill that you pay, when you include all the fees, all the different, all the different factors that are in that billing statement, it really comes out to be about the same. So, when you hear that, when you hear that comment, we don't charge more than everybody else. Um, that's not an accurate statement of how those bills actually turn out. Now. This still doesn't get us to the finish line. We still fall below the threshold in 2028, and we run out of reserves after 2030. So what else, what else do we do? Well, there's a number of different ways that, that we can impact that. One of the ways is through a customer charge, and I'll explain that. If we were to increase our customer charge by $5, and wait until 2025. So if we if we remove the 6% now, and then in 2025, we add $5 to the customer charge, here you can see it again, it shifts out the where we fall below our minimum reserves, shifts it out another couple of years to 2030, and we don't, we don't deplete our reserves until 2032. So again, that gives us more time to analyze how these changes impact the, the bottom line gives us more time to analyze other options that we have and to tr try to push that out even further. People have asked, well, well, what is a customer charge? Well, most utilities, and I don't mean electric utilities, but most utilities, water, sewer service, cable TV, telephone, gas, 
years, several years ago, they shifted away from a 100% usage based fee to customer charge plus usage. The customer charge is calculated based on what it costs to maintain our system, to operate our service, to provide you the service, the connection to your house, the transformer on the pole that serves your block, the bucket trucks and the, and the linemen that come out to restore that power in the middle of the night, the customer service people that, that answer your questions and handle the billing. All of that costs us a certain amount of money, no matter how much power you use. If you look at the lines going down your street, the transformers, the connections to your house, it makes no difference whether you use 1,000 kilowatt hours or your neighbor uses 2,000 kilowatt hours. The cost to maintain that infrastructure is the same. Now, we have had, we've had our consultants do an analysis based on the customer class, the types of service that are provided, and their estimate in... Um, 2015, the study in 2015 was that the cost of providing residential service was $23 per account. It was recommended then that we implement a customer charge, but we'd been living off of usage rates for the history of IPL, so that the decision was made to, to do that. What that does is if... <clears throat> If you're, a, if you're a customer that doesn't use a lot of power, you still expect the light to come on when you flip the switch. In the middle of the night when the power goes off, you still expect the truck to roll and the technician to get out there and fix it. Again, that doesn't matter how much power or how little power you use. So when you're doing all, when all of your revenue is off of usage rates, that means the people that use more power are... Subsi they're subsidizing everybody else. In a community, that may be a good thing. Help your neighbor. What we're seeing now with, the in with, with more and more renewable resources, the person who has rooftop solar. In our, in our network, I don't care how much power they think they make, they are not energy independent. Because there are going to be days, two, three, four days in a row of overcast skies where they're going to need that connection to IPL. There's going to be long nights where they haven't made much energy in the day. And even if they have a battery, they're going to need that connection to IPL. That connection costs, 2015 estimate, $23 per account. They benefit from that connection even if during the day they're generating a lot of their power through solar. If, let's say we have a situation where they generate as much as they used and they net out at zero. In that, in that case, they would still be getting that power at night. They would still get, get that power on those cloudy long weekends, but they wouldn't be paying anything for it. We don't think that's fair or equitable. So a customer charge helps balance that out. And the way you, the way you calculate your rates then is you have a portion of your expenses that are your, your fixed expenses and build that into a customer charge. And then the rest of your revenue is what comes from your rates. And then you can adjust your rates based on, on how, how much of that difference you have to make up. In our case, last in 2018, when the 2018-19, when the, the, the study was reviewed again, now they estimated the customer charge should be around $26. The rates that we implemented in 2020, they, the old rates all sunset in October of 23, and, and everybody will roll to the new rate structure. We implemented a $10 customer charge. So less than half of what the actual cost of service is. Our recommendation here is that if we remove the 6% now, then let's see how things work. Let's look at how the revenues are impacted. But if we, if we forecast ahead that we, in, that we increase that customer charge by $5, and now in 2018 dollars, we're at 15 out of 26. So it's still, still a bargain. That would push this out, this curve out a few more years. One of the things you'll see in utilities 
the utilities that have the, the highest customer satisfaction, the less, less amount of complaints from their customers are those who do incremental changes. If you wait and wait and wait, and then you hit your customers with a 20% increase, that's a problem. You're going to get a lot of dissatisfied customers. So we should plan ahead or forecast ahead incremental changes that can help, help us correct the picture. In this model, if we do in 27, so two years later, if we do another 5% or another $5 increase, that would make the customer charge. And this is just residential. Business and commercial are higher. Industrial is even higher. But um, if we were to re in increase the customer charge by another $5 in 27, now you see all the way out to 2032, we're still above our minimum threshold. So these are, these are incremental changes to our customer bills. And, and we recognize that there's a lot of families out there that have to watch their budget. But these are small incremental changes that will help maintain that, that balance help us to provide that service that they're used to and that they depend on, help us to self-fund more capital projects instead of relying on bonds, and still have reserves left out to 2032. You remember in the first graph I showed you, we were $100 million in the red by 2032. And one more, just forecasting out further, uh, in addition to the $5 and the $5, if we did a 4% a increase in rates um, in 2030, that almost levels the curve. Now, the only recommendation we're making today is let's, let's re remove the 6% discount and get back to our 2012 rates. That'll give us time to examine how, how expenses and revenues, how that continues to evolve and we'll be able to refine these as we go forward. But this just gives you a picture of what's possible. So in conclusion, a reliable and resilient electric system is important, not only for our residents, but for our businesses. One of our local businesses that's one of our top five uh, sources of revenue in the city, we had a meeting with them and they asked us, when are you going to get new generation? We want to know that we can depend on having power 24 seven to run our plant. If you can't provide that, we may have to look elsewhere. In our discussions with the North Point project, as we talked to those developers, one of the things they were very interested in is what's your future? What are your plans? Can, can we rely on having the power we need to serve our customers. So that, that reliable and resilient system, it is important. I mean, we have, we've won the, the award from the American Public Power Association the last two cycles for having one of the best, one of the most reliable systems in the, across the country. It's like the top 1% of public utilities. Um, that's worth something. It's worth investing in and it's worth maintaining. The truth is our revenue is not currently keeping up with those expenses. And it's not, it's not enabling us to do the systematic capital improvement projects that we need to do to maintain that system. Costs are rising. Uh, personnel costs continue to rise. Materials costs continue to rise. The, the amount of money we have to pay for consultants to do some of these engineering and, and analysis for us, that continues to rise. Um, repealing that 6% discount is a necessary first step to helping us get back to a stable footing. Uh, again, utilities all across Missouri are having to deal with this. We're not alone, uh, but these incremental changes will provide the funding we need to have a secure IPL. Subject to your questions, that's the report. Okay, anybody got any questions? I do, Mr. Yeah, Schott. I do too. Um, your last line here, incremental changes will provide needed funding, and that includes the ability to go forward with new investment over time. Um, we always want to ask, well, what happens if you then uh, make a new investment? Certainly. Um, again, part of our part of our analysis is that we would have the that we would have the funds to continue making the debt service. 
Um, you know, we wouldn't have the money to pay something off maybe right away, but we, we could carry the debt service for that incrementally. Something else that's not included because we didn't do in this model, we didn't do any analysis for new generation or new revenue streams because we don't know what those are going to be. But last year when we presented the, the new generation project, our estimate, our conservative estimate was that the new, the new turbines would pay for the debt service. Um, another advantage that is not included is that if we got those, if we got some new generation or new capacity contracts, you notice we didn't, we didn't delete our six combustion turbines right away. As long as those are serviceable, as long as they're operational, if we have excess capacity, we can offer that out into the market for another possible revenue stream. We didn't make any, any assumptions or try to make any estimates. Our crystal ball is not that good, but that would be some potential revenue. And as we, as we go forward and see how all those things balance out, maybe one of those customer charges wouldn't be needed or, or maybe the 4%, but we need time to have that develop. Yeah, Mr. Grover. Yeah, uh, thanks for that presentation. That kind of answers some of my questions, and some of these we may already have answered. Does IPL participate in any kind of surveys, studies, you know, across the industry? We do. Or like size? <coughs> MPUA has done some surveys in the past. Uh, we've had members that have done some benchmarking surveys that we've that we've participated in. The American Public Power Association does nationwide surveys of municipal utilities. Um, there are there are surveys for um, salaries, salaries and benefits, uh, and they compare everything from your your all your lowest hour, hourly position up to the director and and the the upper management, and you can see how how you fall within those. Um, there are cost of service surveys that are done. Uh, there's a number of different surveys that APPA uh, does across every every year or two. And we certainly do participate in those. Well, I know when you're hearing that, you know, we're the highest cost and all that, that may be a way to repudiate that by pulling some of that out. It may be interested to see some of that in the future, you know, some like size utilities and kind of how we compare. Um, what's our current breakdown of customers, industrial, commercial and residential? We have about we have about fifty nine thousand customer accounts um, all all together. Over 90% of that revenue comes from residential accounts. We have another 7 to 8% that is business, commercial, and then a couple of percent that is our industrial. Okay. All right. Um, we're also talking on here about, you know, raising the, the cost of the customer. Customer charge. Customer charge. Thanks. The CC threw me at first. I was thinking of something else. Um what efficiencies does, is IPL looking at or have they done to kind of offset some of these costs? Um, excuse me. I'm having a hard time hearing down here. What kind of things are you all doing as far as efficiencies rather than just raising rates and raising right. rates? Well, I mean, there's, there's a number of things. Uh, obviously, we, we, one of the things we have been looking at in our proposals is more efficient generation so that what fuel we do purchase generates more power, uh, so it's more efficient and the, the cost per uh, increment of energy is less. Um, in 2015, we had about 245 employees. We now have 175. Um, now, a lot of that was uh, from shutting down the, the power plant, but we've continued to, every year, whenever there's a vacancy, we always look at, is that vacancy critical? Do we need to fill it? Can we shift those those um, duties to other places. So we, we evaluate every position prior to refilling it to make sure that we're at the right number for uh, the staff that we have. Well, some of that information might be good in the presentation where you're talking about the new generation was one thing to do, looking at positions and that just to kind of say, we're not just asking, 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 here's what we're doing right. internally to do. Um, uh, another thing that um, one of the things that, that is not just IPL but citywide is looking how we can get some some synergy between departments and to maximize resources that way and to minimize costs to, to okay. do things more efficiently. 
All right. And the last thing I'll make a comment on, on your planning for the future, you said equipment and material costs are increasing, but the delays in getting some of that equipment too have got to impact, you know, costs down the road too. I mean, you know, we heard from IPL or from IPL from Dan over here at Water about the delays on getting hydrants and things. And to me, that's got to drive your costs up too. Well, we've even been in a position where vendors won't give you a firm quote because two years out, they don't know what the cost is going to be. Right. So yes, it does. That does have an impact. Yeah. Okay. But that's what I had. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. So has any, and I'm full of questions. Um, so the 6%, uh, if we're going to, if we're going to get rid of that, have they looked at first what a 2% to a 4% to a 6% would do, like a, a gradual drop of that? And then the second question is, if we take that away, do, doesn't the city get a discount on their, like a municipal rate with like a cheaper rate than businesses do and stuff like that. When the when the rates were proposed in 2019, 2020, uh, the direction that we were given was all rates, 6% discount across the board, everybody gets it. So that was reflected in how those rates were, were set at that time. So will the city, that does that go away with the city then too? If we, I mean, that's up, Ultimately, that's up to the council, but uh, the easiest thing from a programming standpoint for us would be to just take the 6% discount off of the off of the billing calculation for everybody. Including the city. Everybody. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so I just want to clarify, the city has a municipal rate that's approved in the rate structure. Right. So just to clarify there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is, what do we, with, with our, with all of the... Uh, uh, with all of our contracts kind of going, getting ready to go away, what is that? How does that look if we looked at gen, doing more of our own generation then? And I know that figures into what we've already kind of talked about, but what does that give us as far as the ability to look really seriously at that? And I, I came on kind of after all that was kind of discussed, but what would it take for us to get really serious about beginning to provide, you know, work toward providing more of our own generation so we're not so dependent on, on others? Well, the answer is it depends. Um, what technology would we use? Uh, how big would we go? Uh, our estimate for the, the 90 megawatts that we proposed earlier this year, our estimate was that we would not have to increase staff uh, to do that. Um, maybe one or two if, we, if the operating schedule got much, much busier than it already is. Uh, it might take a couple of extra operators to get through all the expected operating periods. But in general, maintenance and operations, engineering, um, warehousing, we didn't, we didn't project any impact on staffing. So that 90 would get us some additional revenue, mm -hmm. minimal increase in costs other than the, obviously the debt service to, to pay for building it in the first place. Bigger, then you, then you might start looking at additional personnel costs in order to staff it and to maintain it. Um, you know, fuel costs, depending on what type of fuel it used. Uh, there's there's a lot of variables that would go into that. Um, we think, and and in cons in consulting with um, our our peers at MPUA Missouri Public Utility Alliance, having a diverse portfolio is probably one of the best hedges that you have against um, unforeseen problems in one sector or another. Uh, you know, not relying on any one particular uh, resource or type of fuel. Uh, so we would continue to look at, at multiple re multiple resources like that in order to balance it out as best we can. Okay, so with our contracts, I'm, I'm sorry, bear with me. So with our contracts expiring, what do we need to do then? Instead of well, we need to we need to be focused on trying to look toward that. Then what do we need to be doing like right now? 
But one of the things we're already doing is our uh, energy marketing partner, uh, Tenasca, uh, one of the things that they do is they watch the market for us and look at, you know, what opportunities are there out there? Um, is there someone that's offering capacity at a, at a cheap rate? Uh, right now, that's no. But um, we continue to look for those opportunities uh, to see if it would if it would make sense to get some of that obligation covered by a contract like the Oneta contract. Um, uh, certainly, as we come toward the end of these contracts, we'll reach out to those companies and see if there's any appetite for extending them. Um, they're, we're already their customer. We got a good record of paying. Would they be interested in in extending an offer to to carry that out further? Uh, we'll have to do some RFIs, uh, request for information, going out to see what types of what types of programs are available out there. Uh, what is the market looking like for whether that's purchase power agreements like we have with the wind farms or the capacity contracts like we have with Oneta. Um, and it'll just be, it'll be a year by year um, research to see what's available and what makes sense for us. Can I, as far go. Oh, okay. I, I wanted to, Mr. Talcott, I want to answer one of your questions. So you asked about what if we phased the 6% to four and four. Mm -hmm. So if you take the 6% chart, and move right. it down, that's what would happen. So we would reach our minimum reserves sooner than this graph because the 6% raises it all up, right? So if you mm -hmm. extend that 6% out and did 2, 2, and 2, or 2, and 4, it just means that where we, in this graph, we reach our minimum reserve target of 25 just after 28, it moves in. Now, I don't know if that becomes 27, but it's definitely sooner. Okay, so it doesn't give us the breathing room quite that the the six percent would would give us. So okay, I wanted okay. to answer that. That's okay, just... appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. And then so back on that, as far as now, I know you're talking. I'm. We're, I want to make sure that we're communicating. I'm talking about actual generation to actually Correct. do something within the city, within IPL, that we can start physically generating more of our power. Certainly. And one of the things we did preparing the recommendation last year, uh, back in, in 2021, we had a, a consultant working with us on what we called our siting study. And the, the purpose of that siting study was to look at all types of resources, what was possible here in Independence, um, you know, how much, acre, how many acres does it take to generate the solar capacity that we would need? How many acres does it take to do wind? Is, do we even have the wind patterns within independence that would make sense for that? Um, that analysis was done and their conclusion was that, uh, and, and we had numbers for all the different, like dollar, millions of dollars per megawatt for all these different resources. The, the best answer for us at, at the time that study was done was either to go with something like a reciprocating engine or a combustion turbine. Can we look at that? Can we revisit that? Certainly. Far uh, I mean, it's we presented it to the PUAB. We can certainly get you a copy. Okay. I mean, but is it possible? Is it possible to look at it again as far as doing it? Well, I mean, we certainly will. We will certainly be coming to you with a proposal for okay. um, additional resources. Okay, but it was important for us to get this the financial piece uh, first to show that we do have a we have a plan to carry us forward, and with that behind us, then we can start talking about what else we can do to to further maintain the IPL system. Okay, last question, I promise. Um, so, with this six percent, if we take that away, did has has everything been looked at? I mean, has, and the reason I'm asking that is because we found, you know, we were we were losing apparently a hundred thousand a year on meter cans. Um, you know, we're we're paying seventy five hundred bucks a year uh, for advertisement at the Mavericks. So I guess what I'm getting at is, if we're have we looked to make sure that we're not missing anything somewhere that either we're not catching not on purpose or anything like that, but that we're, that we're missing, that, that we're not, that we're not catching, that we're not capturing 
whether it's something that we're not collecting, whether it's something that maybe just kind of, you know, it's kind of like when you tell somebody something and then it goes down the line, it changes by the time you get to the last person. Sure. So is there anything fun wise that, I don't know that you, 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 do you kind of right. follow what I'm getting at. We are looking at a number of different things. Uh, I know I've got a team right now that is reviewing the schedule of fees uh, for the different services we provide and making sure that those are appropriate. Um, I don't, Dan can tell you that uh, every year when we look at how much we're failing to collect, it's, it's like 1% or less. Uh, so we're actually, we're successfully collecting uh, you know, the lion's share of the, uh, the bills that are out there uh, to kind of put it in perspective, our revenue is $130 million a year, $7,500 from cans or what uh, those, those are incremental costs that are not going to drive the, uh, the equation. When we estimated, um, when we talked last year about about new generation and how would we how would we fund the uh, debt service, we looked at just as an as a as a ballpark figure five dollars per account that would raise approximately three and a half three point seven million dollars. So five dollars is three and a half is three and a half million uh, seventy five hundred or even a hundred thousand divided out amongst all of our accounts doesn't amount to much. Now we will we will certainly look at continuing to evaluate all the various sources of, of revenue that we've got and make sure that those are appropriate. But this is the driver. And the six percent. And the six percent was there like a was there like a time frame on that that no or, sir. okay. Anybody else? Oh. Adam wants to talk. On that. Oh. Mr. Norris. I don't want to interrupt if there's more questions, but I just want to add and to make sure we're clear. You know, anytime we look at a new service or about, or look at a service differently, you know, we look for efficiencies. We look for cost savings, particularly through the budget process. Our office and department directors know they're challenged to look at how we provide services to our customers or to the public to make sure we're doing it in the most efficient way possible. And each budget year, we tighten that up, we make improvements, we exercise and implement cost saving measures. So I just, and you know, whether it's $10,000 or $50,000, those are all important savings that, you know, improve our operations and reduce our costs. So we look at that every year. We don't take that lightly. We look at that all the time. Right. And that wasn't an accusatory thing. I, I was no, just no, trying to, because I, I want to look, even in my own finances, yeah. you know, I have to look, okay, if we're short somewhere, okay, are we missing something? So. Yeah. And I'm, this was not a, a, a defensive response. I just want to make it clear that that's absolutely a priority for us. Our city manager always drives that point to to all of us as a leader, leadership team to make sure we're we're looking at that all the time. That, that was it. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I, I've got a couple questions. Jim, you're wanting to go back to 2012. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We want to go back to the rates we established in 2012. All right. I don't know if anybody else, but everything cost a heck of a lot more than it did in 2012. I just pulled up. It's our government. You do trust the government, don't you? I went to the Bureau of Labor Statistics to get some of this information. All right. My $100 in 2012 now cost me $126. That figures out to be about about 2% per year increase. And you're asking to go back to 2012? I, I, You know what? You've done a fantastic job. All of you guys have. I mean, you're running our city very, very well. I mean, I don't know how you do it. I mean, we need to take care of the reserve. We need to make sure that we're doing more power generation in our own town. And we need to quit pinching pennies to death. I don't have a problem with this. As far as I'm concerned, the dormant accounts that we have in the city, and there's going to be more and more people that are going to be saying, well, I'm not using electricity here. 
but you're right. They are responsible. When they need electricity, they're going to flip that switch. And if it doesn't come on, they're going to be angry. They should have to pay a basic service charge, whatever that basic service charge is. If you're saying it's 25 or $26, we can't implement that overnight, but we can implement it over a five-year period. I mean, but to, you want to roll back the rates to 2012. Anyone that would be upset with that is just goofy. I mean, really? You've done a great job. I mean, I don't know why we're even having this discussion. I think it was foolish for us to reduce the rates when we know that we have to have this money to create more electricity. And you can't create more electricity with your hands are tied, no money in the bank to buy it. That's just all I got. Well, Let's I can see. answer why we're having this discussion because this team is the place that discussion starts. And having your, having your support going to the council uh, is the next step of that. Well, you know how I feel. Mr. Chairman, I second what Mr. McDonald said. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have anything? I, the, the customer charge would be $5 a month, every month for, what was it, two years? The, the current rate structure is, uh, the current rates that we have in, that will, that will sunset in 23, uh, or that will go into effect in 23, that has a $10 charge. We're, what we're suggesting is in 2025, increase that by five. Okay. And then so in 27, right. And then in 27, increase $20. it again. Now, again, keep in mind those right now, those are just, those are just projections. Uh, all we're asking for right now is return us to 2012, uh, go back to those rates, and then that'll give us more time to evaluate this, look at the, look at how the reserves respond, look at how revenues impacted. And then we can continue this discussion to make incremental changes in the future. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to need some time to do some math. I've been trying to do some math in the corner of the, the presentation here, and it's it's getting a little <laughs> confusing. So I'm going to need to sit at home and do some math. But uh, I appreciate the presentation. And, and we uh, will be we will be given we will be giving this presentation to the council at the January study session. Okay. That three weeks. It's the second Monday of, of January, so that maybe we'll four weeks four out. Weeks. But, yep. Okay. Does anybody have anything else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I think they're needing a motion. a motion from us. I know that you'd like to have more time to study this, but I just want you to think one thing. What did you buy in 2012? that you can buy today for 6% less. I mean, these guys have done a great job of running our utility. They're just wanting their hands untied so they can get back to 2012. I mean, if nothing else, we need to untie their hands and let them do their job. Well, do, do we need a motion on something today? Was your intent to get a motion today on this? Or get it? Yes. Uh, things may move rapidly in January, and right now, but with the council's rule of procedure, we have to have things on the agenda two Fridays before the meeting. If we wait, if we wait and discuss this again at the January meeting, now you're talking delaying into February, and uh, there's a lot of things that we're going to be talking about here over the next couple of months. And uh, my recommendation and my request is that we get started. All right, then I'll make a motion that we uh, rescind that 6% rate increase, get back to the 12% or rate decrease to get back to the 2012 rate structure. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, so we're looking at, just my math, we're, we're looking at raising the average bill $84 a year. Does that sound about right to you six to seven dollars six percent yes that'd be about about seven dollars a month so 84 a year yeah okay. all right there's a motion in a second uh, anybody have anything else 
Then please call the roll. Michael Talkett? No. David McDowell? Yes. Jerry Tindall? Yes. Anthony Jeremita? Good pass. Let's vote right. Can I vote with two hands? Yes. <laughs> yes. I will vote yes reluctantly. I don't I don't like it, but I mean my thing is I would this is like a now or never kind of thing. I I yeah. I don't I don't do any major thing without sleeping on it. So eighty four dollars. I don't my my big worry is there are there are rate payers in this town that eighty four dollars a year is a lot of money to them. You know, um, uh, I I know people seven dollars a month. They they can come up with seven dollars a month. You know, and I hate I hate to hamstring somebody like that, but I'm on social I will, security. I will. Mr. Chairman, I'm on Social Security, and I think I just got an 8% raise for just one year. Um, we're asking our utilities to sit here and not even get an increase. They're providing us this, and it works. We have the best electricity around. In the sense, when we have an outage, we're not waiting days. Our people, are they're right on top of it. And I'm I'm proud of you. Doggone it! We're running this thing on. We can work on eight too. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have one more thing. Yes, sir. On our agenda, did I, did we not need to approve minutes from the last meeting? <laughs> the, the, the minutes weren't ready. Okay, for that's. I just wanted to meeting. make sure because I thought <laughs> they, we had a meeting, but. I've slept since then, so yes. I just wanted to make sure. We had this discussion before the meeting. Uh, okay. The minutes will be ready for approval on the next, Perfect. the last meeting and this meeting will be on next month. I forgot to add them to the agenda. Right. Oh, not a problem. So just was making sure. Motion carried. Yes, the, the vote passed, right? Okay, the motion, the motion passed. Okay. So that brings us to upcoming items, IPL, Development of Future Generation, uh, Finance Administration, and uh, IPL 10-year financial projections. Um, Mr. Meeting. Chairman, I think we just took care of that one. Oh, that, that's the one. That, okay, so we will mark that one off. Okay, our next meeting will be January 19th, 2023. Does anybody have any comments before we lined up here i do want to thank you for the presentation though because it was it it helps me understand stuff more also so um everybody have a happy holidays yeah, oh mr norris sorry I, i'll defer to the rest of the board if they have any further comments but i just want to add one thing sure go ahead okay. uh, i hope i hope you all the the door is always open for you all to ask questions of us. Okay, um, you know if if you have questions after the meeting, Mr. Talcott, please reach out to to our team here, and we're happy to talk with you and meet with you, whatever it is, to address questions. Okay, so okay. we're we're here to answer questions. All right. Does anybody have anything else? Happy holidays. Everybody have a happy holiday. Be safe. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you next year.